This city is one of the greatest cities. And I feel like I'm kind of paying the city back. I mean, Cincinnati is just big enough and just small enough that uh, if you really set your mind to it, there's really nothing you can't accomplish. I'm Yvette Simpson. I'm a council member, president pro tem of Cincinnati City Council. And I avoided politics like the plague. I think it was always something that I thought, you know, you gotta be one of those kind of people to be a politician. And I never considered myself one of those people. And we know those people, you know, the, the connotation of politicians is almost as bad as that of lawyers, probably worse. And I just never wanted to be a politician. Thought I'd be a lawyer, but never thought I'd be in this seat. And you gotta watch that word never, cause it'll always come back and bite you in the butt. I started to realize though, as I was kind of giving back to my community through lots of organizations and watching our city try so hard to become the city I always knew it could become, that it was the politicians that were in the way. And there was a woman who's a politician, I won't name her name, but you might know who she is. And she said to me, uh, you should consider running. And I said, no way, I'll never do it. And she said, well, why don't you work on my campaign? And I said, okay, I'll do it. And then after watching her campaign, I said, definitely not. Definitely don't want to do this. I think after that, I just noticed more and more um, that I felt like our government was kind of in the way of the progress that Cincinnati was trying so hard to make. And I called her up and I said, we need to go to lunch. And so we went to lunch over at Melt and Northside and it didn't take her two seconds. She sat down and I sat down and she looked at me and she said, you're gonna do it, aren't you? And I said, yep, I'm gonna do it. And I decided that I wanted to be a positive change for the city. And I call it the grand experiment because what I said was, there's no way you can win being yourself and being a person of integrity and a person you know, who has all kinds of standards and a person who is authentic. You can't be a politician. And so I was never supposed to win. Even on the campaign trail, people were saying, oh, you know, she's, she's you know, smart, she's a lawyer, she's accomplished, but she doesn't come from a political family and she doesn't have a lot of money. And so we broke, I mean, almost every rule on the campaign trail. You know, people said, you're supposed to go in a room and shake as many hands as you can and tell people your name. And I thought, that doesn't sound right. Who wants to do that? And so I'd spend the whole time in the corner talking to three people while my competitors were, you know, off to the next event. And I'm still talking to the same three people. And people thought, if that you're not going to meet enough people because you're just staying places too long. And I thought, well, if I don't meet enough people, then that's fine. Well. What happened was <laughs> those three people that I talked to told everybody they knew that I had spent the time with them and they knew about me and I knew about them. And the folks in the church who saw me, they said, wow, we watched everybody else leave the room and Yvette stayed the whole time and talked to us afterwards. And so we broke every single rule and it worked. I love the first day I came into work. Um, we sat on the dais at our council meeting and I look out in the audience and I see this young girl. She's got to be about 12 or 13 years old. I can tell because she's got that right kind of style. You know, she's kind of got the bow popping right here and she's kind of got a little sleeve right here. So I know she's probably around that age where she's too cool for school. And I come down and I step down from the dais and she looks at me and she says, you're beautiful and you inspire me. And it's a tough story to tell without kind of tearing up because I was that girl. And my story is uh, one that I think is not unlike a lot of our kids in our community. And it was tough. There was some back and forth and some up and down, you know, growing up in poverty. I was raised by my grandmother without either of my parents. Uh, my dad, drug addicted, 20 years. Uh, my mom, uh, mentally ill. And my grandmother was struggling to raise four of her grandchildren after raising eight of her own children. I remember. Uh, we were a part of the WIC program, which is a program that provides milk and cheese and other things to families that are needy. And it was my job on Tuesday morning, early, between six and seven, to go down and get the WIC basket before somebody stole it. <laughs> you know, waking up early in the morning to make sure that the milk and cheese and eggs that we needed made it in the house. Um, and hoping that that made, you know, made it through the week for us. You wake up in the morning, um, there are days when you don't know that there's gonna be food there. We did the best we could. There were really, really tough days. There were days where, you know, we call it uh, nose and toes when we had relatives staying. And so me and my sister and my cousin are all in the same bed, <laughs> nose and toes, head, head, to, head to feet. 
um, just because my grandmother was a matriarch of our family and she took care of everybody. And I mean, she was, she was everything to me. Um, she certainly made her mistakes and uh, we were exposed to a lot of challenging circumstances because of that. But had she not taken us, I don't know where we would have been. I mean, she had raised all of her kids, right? And then to, to raise us in her 60s, um, when most people were starting to settle in, uh, was something remarkable. Uh, and she never thought about it for one second. It was never something that she ever paused on. And she raised me literally from the moment I came out but she gave us everything. And, you know, certainly from her generation, she gave us lots of boundaries. <laughs> so we weren't gonna be getting in too much trouble, that's for sure. <laughs> um, she and her army of grandmas in our community really kept us safe. Um, you couldn't really, you know, if you walked in Miss Sarah's grass, by the time you got home, your, your, you know, your grandma knew Miss, you'd walk through Miss Sarah's grass and you were gonna be in trouble. We had to be in by the time the street lights came on and, you know, Little adventurer like me waits for the flicker of the light and then runs as fast as I can. I want to stay out one more minute uh, and that flicker happens and you just pray your foot hits the door by the time the street light comes on because otherwise you're in trouble. And I remember right before graduation, uh, when I turned 16, my grandmother moved to a senior facility uh, and I was the youngest and the only one really left in the house. Came home from school and they said, okay, your stuff is all packed up. Your grandma's got to go to a senior facility. We don't know where you're going to go. And I thought, wow, you know, and from 16 to 18, I probably moved four times uh, from, a, you know, a couch at my aunt's house to, you know, a room in my cousin's house to um, and just really pushing through. And I would wake up every morning and I'd say, God, just get me to 18. When I can control it, I'll do better. Just get me to 18. And it's so funny because once I turned 18, it felt like everything got better. You know, I went off to college and, you know, it's been nothing but upward since then. You know, it was like, I never thought I'd make it to that day. And then I did. And I always say God front loaded my pain. You know, it was all there before 18. And then after that, it's just been nothing but blessings. So that story of that little girl really shocks me because I think she looks at me and she says, I'm beautiful and I inspire her. And I look at her and I'm like, I'm you, <laughs> you know, I mean, I am. I sometimes I feel like I'm still that little girl. You know, I see our kids, I see um, what they go through. I look in their eyes and they look just like me, you know, living every day, um, one step in front of the other, trying to make it, dealing with what feels like, you know, insurmountable obstacles every single day. And then one day realizing, wow, you know, I made it, I'm here. You know, my story is one that I think for the rest of my life will be about um, earning back the credit uh, that I've been given to come from essentially the projects um, on welfare, um, again, without either of my parents to be in this seat. And I think it, that's the exact touch that it takes to be in this job, always remembering who you were, never forgetting that and bringing that with you to work every day. I feel like I bring that girl with me to work every day. You know, that kind of feisty, uh, if pushed, um, certainly willing to give everything to make it work, uh, work as hard as I can, work with as many people as I can, trying to make the city better. And I feel like I'm kind of paying the city back because if a girl can come from where I come from and become the person that I am, then guess what? I should give back and make sure that that little girl um, gets to sit in my seat someday. This city is one of the greatest cities to allow that. And I think this is the only city that that can happen in. I mean, Cincinnati is just big enough and just small enough that if you really set your mind to it, there's really nothing you can't accomplish.